to this conversation between the Vice Chancellor, Dr. Max Price, and Judge Dennis Davis. Both of them don't need any introductions, but as we are all aware, Dr. Max Price has finished his five years a five-year term as vice chancellor. And of course, prior to the consideration whether or not uh, we reappoint him for another term, there is an arduous process that is required by the rules of this university that needs to be followed. And this entails consulting with various stakeholders uh, in this university. And I was privileged to preside over this process. And of course, at the end of it all, there was an overwhelming support for our vice chancellor to be, to be considered for another five-year term. I can recall some of the uh, responses we got. They went something like this. Max has performed well across the board. He has paid attention to teaching and learning. He has kept UCT as a high-performing and excellent research space. He has provided strategic leadership he manages budget processes and ably demonstrates an intimate knowledge in which the budget operates and what parameters of choice are. A great ambassador for this university, an exceptional CEO. What a pleasure to have an outgoing multitasking, multitasker doing a great job. Those are some of the uh, responses we got. And of course, with such a wide support from a broad church of this university, it became very easy for council to uh, appoint Max for another five-year term. And we congratulate you, Max, on that. Now, it's over to you. Uh, and Judge Dennis Davis to take the podium and share with us and reflect with us the past five years and what your vision is for the future, uh, the challenges we face as a nation in higher education in general, and the challenges we face as university, as University of Cape Town in particular, and your leadership in the future to take this university to where it has never been before. Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome Dr. Price and Judge Dennis Davis. Thank you very much, uh, Archbishop. Um, perhaps I should start by just trying to outline how we're going to operate this evening. Um, clearly, apart from the questions that I'm going to put to Max Price, I would have thought that there'd be people in the audience amongst you who know the university better than I do, who have strong views about various issues, who would like to feel that maybe I haven't asked the right questions or the questions that you would like to ask. And so the way I've decided best to do this is to break up our discussion into segments, and at each of segments, at the end of that, I'm going to pause and, and then invite you the, uh, to, to ask questions, those of you who wish to. I hesitate in that because, of course, some people have already done that. Uh, I have been inundated uh, with all sorts of questions um, which have been asked by people right across the university community and I'm going to try my very best. In fact, all these little stickers are here because I've tried to incorporate many of them into the conversation we're going to have to the extent 
that I get that wrong, those of you in the audience can get up and, and, and uh, take, put further questions. There will obviously be some questions which just, uh, we, to be perfectly frank, if I have to go through all of them, we'll be here all night. And, and, and that obviously would be ridiculous. So you'll excuse me, there will be certain questions, I'll read them out at the end, which we're not going to deal with, but the vice chancellor assured me he will be responding to this. What in the f whatever your newspaper is called? The Monday paper. The Monday paper. Monday paper yeah. Good. Okay. So that's the format for this evening. So let me start by putting this to you. In your first speech, well, your first speech, the only speech, um, that you gave when you became our vice chancellor uh, on this very day in 2008, you raised four key issues that you put on the table. And let me just remind you, independence and academic freedom, role as an intellectual and moral compass, that is the university, a commitment to debate and tolerance, and discovery of new knowledge. And I want to perhaps probe you on those four. Let me start with the question of independence and academic freedom. There is a suggestion that we should be somewhat concerned because uh, the Minister of Higher Education, Dr. Zamandi, has plans for universities which may not necessarily be congruent with academic freedom. Are you concerned at all about that? That's a good way to start. And <laughs> well, I'm <laughs> sorry. I, you know, I'm popular with the this minister. is not a Senate meeting. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I just want to say thanks to the Archbishop, the Chair of Council, for his very generous introduction, which uh, if I thought that was coming, we could have just had that and gone home. There would have been nothing... <laughs> Oh, we'll come say. back to the Archbishop later <laughs> too. Yeah. Um, so what I, what I, you're, you're pointing to a comment I made in my inaugural lecture, which was in 2008, and it was a time when we were particularly concerned about a whole lot of state intervention in, in the judiciary, uh, questioning the Constitution. Our, our confidence in the safety of the Constitution was, was uh, being shaken, and also academic freedom. And so... Uh, so it's a good question because my sense is that we went through a few years where that anxiety level dropped, actually. We weren't so anxious about it. But in the last year and a half, uh, we've become very anxious again. Um, and there have been two particular interventions. One has been the protection of information, so-called protection of information bill, which the secret, what we've called the secrecy bill, which um, has had a whole lot of elements that threatened uh, academic freedom as well as the po possibility of doing research, of accessing information, accessing archives. And I think, fortunately, we rose to that challenge, the university, the students. Um, we went on marches, we wrote to the papers, we went to present to the Portfolio Committee, I presented to Parliament as well. And that bill has been substantially amended. So while it's not perfect, I have to say that uh, if there is, if I needed evidence of where civil action, citizen action can make a difference, that's a good example of it. And the university played its part in that. The second has been this Amendment Act, which was passed into law in December last year, which uh, gives the Minister of Higher Education the right to suspend councils, suspend vice chancellors, if they basically if they don't do what he wants them to do. Let me just have some water. Um, the the uh, minister says that this is for universities in crisis. And indeed, there have been uh, a number of universities in crisis. We've had four he, uh, in the last few years where he suspended the council, suspended the vice chancellor, um, took over, appointed an administrator. And I have to say that in those four cases, I think he did the right thing. And the minister is sometimes in a difficult position. These are public universities, and if the universities are being bankrupted or if, if there's corruption, there's tenders to members of council and um, uh, people being appointed, a vice chancellor, they wanted to appoint one council who, did, who had a fake PhD that he'd bought. And I think it was right for the minister to intervene. So there's a fine line between that and... But the powers are greater than that. The powers are greater. He, he, so can, <laughs> define, he can define... I mean, he could kick Precisely. you out of office. So my concern yeah. is that he's taken what was a legitimate concern, which was the need to be able to step in and, and address problems and suspend councils. But then he's added in some clauses, and one of the clauses he's added in says that if he thinks that the university isn't meeting its duty of equity to those to whom it owes such a duty, 
then he can issue a directive, he, he or she, the minister, can issue a directive that the university must honour that commitment of equity. And if they don't, then he must suspend the council. Now, if you decode that, a commitment of equity might mean uh, the need to admit a student who uh, comes from a designated group who the university doesn't think should be admitted, maybe for other reasons, but he thinks there's a duty of equity, and so he takes over through that admissions policies of universities. It might mean the demand to promote an academic who is, let's say, a senior lecturer to an associate professor, uh, and he may think that the university is discriminating on racial grounds or other grounds, and so that the duty of equity isn't being honored and intervene to do that. So I think it's, as it stands, it's dangerous, and we've been meeting with the minister. He's agreed to a working group to relook at it because we've said in our council, to the credit of the Archbishop and the council, has said that if we can't get the act changed through this negotiation, then we would go to court to challenge it. And will, I mean, you see, some of us are old enough to remember acts that didn't mean what they said, such as the extension of the Universities yeah. Act, which meant the restriction of universities, or the movement Movement of Population Act, which actually was influx control. Now, so, you know, one's got to be, what goes around comes around. Uh, uh, will this university, uh, are you, what I'm asking, I suppose, is this. You're not going to sit there in a smoke-filled room with the minister and just deal with this. And if you don't get your way, that's it. Will the university, in fact, organize properly to resist this kind of encroachment? Yeah, I and I don't mean just courts. I don't think courts are yeah. necessarily the only way you should go. Uh, well, I think we will, although I don't think we want to go into this negotiation with the minister with a threat. Um, we I'm not asking to... for threats. I'm yeah. just interested in what your default position is. Yeah, I think the default position would be to call students out to protest, to call faculty out to protest. I suspect that the protest in this environment might be less effective than the court action, uh, but uh, we would also have to get enough other universities together that would join us. It's not a battle Far less just costly, for UCT. I should tell you, to protest than to go to court. Yeah. All right, let me move on to the next point. You spoke about the role of, as an intellectual and moral compass, and you raised four issues. You said the university should tackle four particular issues. You were concerned about constitutionalism, HIV AIDS, crime, and education. Now, when I look back on that now, five years later, I wonder whether you weren't targeting too wide a range of activities because I'm not quite sure you, you, you would have to tell me but I, what have we done about things like crime or constitutionalism I mean it's true I, I, I can read the odd piece by Professor DeForce but but beyond that what are we doing and, and yet these were the things that you signaled out that the university had to be committed to yeah so let's take them uh, seriously in fact I have to confess that we expanded the number rather than reduced it or focused yeah, it more. I'm not worried about the numbers, <laughs> I'm worried about the delivery. So, Big problem in this country. So constitutionalism, just as, as a start, because we've already been talking a bit about it. Yes, that. that's true. Um, and that is one example. But the chair, that the Claude Leon chair uh, in um, constitutional democracy, which Pierre de Foss occupies, was created and appointed uh, shortly after that. And it was one example of how we, I think the university needs to ensure that its intellectuals, that its academics are public intellectuals and they engage. And we've tried to stimulate that uh, across, across the board. And I think if you, and we do measure the column space that we get on various issues, I think you would find that the presence of the university in the media has been much greater in the last five years than it had for perhaps the 15 years before. No, I don't think and, that's so. Where, the, where do you get that from? I mean, I think that there was uh, a time, a time that people here during the apartheid era really said a huge amount. Yeah, no, I was saying in the 15 years Oh, before. okay, so 15 from, years. Okay, my so yeah, wonderful. Okay, from 1994. Fair okay. And I think that there were, it wasn't just because of me. I think the country went through a sort of honeymoon period where people were more reluctant to tackle, to lay into the government or into public officials and that we're over that. So there's uh, much more willingness. But in terms of my own role, uh, to the extent that I could uh, lead by example, uh, have been you know, writing op-ed pieces, writing letters, participating in marches, organizing or helping organize uh, marches on campus, 
uh, around a range of issues. Uh, and so trying to signal to the world and particularly to our students that this should be an activist university, that that's part of our role, is to engage, to be active citizens, and to, one of the marches was in support of the uh, Social Justice uh, Coalition, for example, uh, and to signal that um, that's, that's part of what we do. Okay. So, um, but there have been also <coughs> other, um, particularly in, in law, uh, but also, for example, uh, the, in, in the law faculty, but the group uh, D. Smythe and, and the group that's been looking at the traditional uh, courts bill has been really important in looking at the role of w- rural women. I take it they've been fantastic. I don't think we have to go... to make okay. a difference. Fair uh, enough. Yeah. What about the others? Uh, violence, violence, safety and violence. Uh, well, in, in, all of, in the other initiatives, most of them, in four of them, uh, we've created structures across the university which are headed either by a pro-vice-chancellor where it was possible to find someone who... Uh, was at that level of academic standing that they could be appointed to that. And the two that we appointed pro-vice-chancellors for were climate change and development, which was an additional initiative, and and poverty and inequality, which underpins all the others. Climate change and development is Professor Mark New, and poverty and inequality is Professor Murray Labrant. And in these initiatives, we've pulled together people from across the university who who do related work, uh, and the interventions range from stimulating new research, uh, creating workshops and conferences, uh, engaging with policymakers, in the case of poverty and inequality, particularly with the National Planning Commission and Trevor Manuel, and that commission is a major funder of this initiative. For example, the Carnegie Three inquiry last year was part of that initiative, which brought together both inside the campus and from across the country some 300 and something papers funded uh, about 50% by the National Planning Commission and has triggered a three-year program of work uh, ranging from nutrition, schools, rural and land issues. So some of them are slightly indirectly related to the economy and poverty and inequality. Others are directly about job creation and employment. In in climate and change and development, um, aside from working with, for example, the COP7 Durban conference and having a lobby also with government, we've created a master's program which brings people from all, the, all different disciplines who want to work in climate change and development and uh, gives them the opportunity to move into that area. Crime and violence, safety and violence, which is uh, one of them. We, have, we appointed uh, Guy Lamb to be the director of that initiative. Unfortunately, that initiative took longer to get going. We had re- advertised but didn't find someone for two years. But in the last year, he's been there for a year. In the last year, it's really taken off. And that initiative um, has about 35 academics from units across the campus. They're doing major work, for example, around substance abuse and uh, domestic violence, substance abuse and personal injury, mainly in the health sciences faculty, but also with psychology and others. Um, they're doing work with the Western, with the Western Cape government on... Um, uh, Initiatives, housing, not sorry, housing, community district initiatives, housing for safety, it's actually called. Uh, they're doing work in Hanover Park on uh, gangs and schools. And so what, what, they, what they're trying to do in that area is research and policy. All right. I want to come back to this in relation to the question of the role of the university is research, but let me, let me move on to your third one. The commitment to debate and tolerance. Now, there are two things I wanted to ask you here. Firstly, to what extent have we fashioned within the university the kind of identity that would allow us to actually truly be tolerant of each other? In other words, to what extent have we been able to fashion the idea of an identity of a truly non-racial community in which people can have robust exchanges? It was the race debate happening before I came here that particularly triggered that concern. I had a sense when I came that people felt that um, if you, that when you got into the debate about race, you were either labeled racist or you were labeled as playing the race card, depending on which side of the debate you were, and that that was having a chilling effect on discussion. And people were just not willing to engage. They were, they were withdrawing. When they did engage, it was usually sort of off the record or amongst people who they... Who felt they had the same ideas. And um, my concern was that, this, that a university where 
that debate should be free and people, no views in a sense should be heretical. No one should be condemned for their views. Uh, that the university was at risk and in fact it wasn't that sort of environment. It would be hard for me to be sure whether it's how free it is, but I think, and we'd have to ask members of the Well, audience, I'm intrigued because what I want to pray about. I think it's honest, a lot freer. I think people are comfortable but, in that debate. But is there a sense in which we're actually. I, that, we're, that people don't feel alienated one from the other. To what extent is this becoming a community which prefigures the sort of South Africa which was imagined in our constitution, but which in our grander society is a long way from being achieved? And it's a long way from being achieved here too. I just think we're making progress. I think the, de- I think the debates and discussions happen more freely. They happen in Senate. We had uh, some really good debates, public debates, around uh, the admissions policy, and my sense was that people felt comfortable expressing a very wide range of views, and others, and, and others were tolerant and, and listening to those, and they're robust debates. Well, okay. <coughs> I'll, I'll, but can, can I ask one thing about this, which perhaps you may want to deal with in a slightly different way? But I just thought because this issue of the relationship between the various parts of our university community, in other words, the academics, the professionals, the support staff, there's always a perennial tension between the various components, Mm. and that still exists, Mm. and you have to accept that. And to what extent, and and, and that's quite felt, that's quite deeply felt from what the research that I started anecdotally to be doing in preparation for this. And that was something I wasn't really aware of coming in five years ago. I've become more aware of it. I don't think we've made a lot of progress in that regard. And uh, if you were to come maybe at the end of Well, I'll say it now, but on my list of things that need to be tackled for the next five years, um, this is one of the um, high-priority issues around what we've called institutional culture. The the sense on on both sides, the sense of this divide, the sense that um, our professional and administrative staff have that they're not valued uh, as, as much as academics because academia is considered the core business and the rest is support, so there's that perception, and it seems to me it gets uh, reproduced in all sorts of subtle ways, which I'm not even fully aware of, and we need to well, what is our deal core with that. Our core, bus- our core business is to be an academic institution, mm-hmm. research, teaching, and, uh, um, and engage scholarship. But that core business can't be done without uh, twice as many non-academic staff. So we have twice as many non-academic staff in the university as we have academic mm-hmm. staff. Um, and that's because the academic staff can't live and work without the others. Everything from managing student recruitment and registering students and records and graduations and exam systems to um, making sure that you know, when there's a, a, a power outage that we still have power, the maintenance, the new buildings. We had a phenomenal building program over the last five years. Uh, which and, and maintenance programs. So all of that is essential uh, support to the academic program. Well, I'll also return to that because it's a convenient way for me to get to a fourth point, which is discovery of new knowledge. And that, of course, leads us to research. Mm. And there were a series of questions that were asked by people within the university community about this. I've selected a couple which I want to press you on. The one is this. Uh, UCT suggested it's supposed to be a research-led university. There's a strong link between excellence research and economic and social development of society. Point being, that instead of selecting four or five or six topics, in a way, if you do the one, it's going to flow into the other. Why then, the question is asked, have you not promoted excellence in research as a core function of all staff, and why is excellence research not recognized or adequately rewarded? And there are a whole range of points made about the funding models that we adopt, that it doesn't privilege really fine researchers, that in fact... uh, uh, you don't give them the kind of recognition, they get minimal recognition, there's not sufficient promotion of excellence. That it should be the core function and you're not doing that. Perhaps I'll, I'll answer it, but I just want to highlight the fact that, there's another, that there was another question sent, which was that we only privilege research and we don't privilege teaching. I'm coming to teaching, and, don't worry. <laughs> and huh? so I'm going <laughs> to... One of the wonders here is that I can get you from everyone, both sides, you see. So everyone is going to feel aggrieved in some ways, but let me start yeah, with the Let's research. start with the research. The track record 
of the actual performance of the university in research is, I think, phenomenal. Uh, the num measured in the objective criteria of the growth in the number of publications, the growth in citations, the growth in the amount of money that is being raised by research contracts and research grants, the number of A-rated scientists that we have, the number of rated scientists, uh, the number of centers of excellence, the Saatchi chairs, the South African research, you know, there, these, there is the South African NRF research chairs. There are about, now I think about 90 in the country, and 33 of them are at UCT. Uh, if we were getting our fair share in terms of proportions out of 23 universities, we would have about five or six. So to have 33, and this has been growing. So I think that the track record of research at the university is very good. That doesn't mean we're rewarding research as well. No, enough, it doesn't. It doesn't mean that it, you couldn't be much better. Yeah, but, and it doesn't, so it doesn't, mean, but it doesn't mean we're not valorizing research as, a, as an activity. <coughs> how, do we, how do we reward researchers? I suspect that one of the things underlying that question is the debate about whether we should be paying researchers a direct subsidy for their publications, because many universities do do that. So, yeah, um, and, and you that's don't. a direct reward. We don't because um, we, we don't think that that is... Uh, well, it, we, we think that you should fund research based on a proposal of what the person's going to do and a decision about whether it's excellent. So why can't and they get the money to do further research from the research that they've done? Because that money is funding research across the board. So if you want to... So let me get this right. So, so, so good people have to subsidize poor people. In a sense, everyone had to start off. And we need no, to no, make I'm not sure. talking about start off. I mean, we can deal with that. What about well, the that's, fact? That's what we well, do. Well, let's. Have, so you're telling me that this money is used for start offs. So that's why they don't get. So the money is used to fund not only start offs. It's used to fund everyone, but it's used to fund people. Let, let me give you an example. Sure. The, the money that you get from a research publication, for a science publication, is exactly the same, about 120,000 rand, as the money you get for a legal publication in your field. But the cost of doing the science publication is 10 times higher. It needs consumables, it needs laboratories, it may need a much bigger team of researchers oh. or scientists. If you were to fund the research by rewarding people the way that the government gives us the subsidy, you would have very little work done in the humanities and, the, and commerce and in, law, and in law, and you'd have a lot of, maybe a lot more money going into the sciences and the health sciences. So what we're trying to do is we take that amount of money that we get and we decide what is the best way to spend it. Sometimes, some of it is gets spent on new researchers who cannot write their own research grants yet or won't be successful because they don't have a track record. Some of it is spent on postdocs. Some is on doctoral scholarships across the board, and they, and they are needed in all areas. Some to fund research that's not expensive, but a lot of it goes disproportionately to research that's more expensive. Well, then let me put another question to you in relation to this. The question is put concerning the aspirational goal of taking UCT from being a research-led university to one that was research-intensive. The question says, given the inadequacy of South African government support for research, and I think we have to accept that that is so, and I certainly take cognizance of the fact that we're now going to have two more universities, so God alone knows where we're going to get any more money from, from the government, and the growing competition for third stream income from universities in Asia, South America, and elsewhere in Africa, how do you propose to configure UCT's funding model to support this? Can I come back to the previous question of rewarding the researchers? Yeah, but I'm much more... Okay, okay, yeah. You know, new money. Yeah. Well, new money well, is really important. Well, so you can come back with pleasure, a big, but I want to It's a big challenge, and, yeah? and it's, it's, one of, it's another one of those challenges for the next five years. Um, we've been doing reasonably well, but, uh, and we've been doing well mainly from international funders. So... Uh, we get a large amount of money from Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. We've just received a significant amount uh, for economics research. Uh, a couple of days ago, 10 million rand coming through for JPAL, one of the economics research units. Um, and what we have to do firstly is to ensure that we have the infrastructure to help people access those international funds. That infrastructure is partly by running, for example, efficient offices, um, by we're going to probably be employing more people who help write research grants because academics spend a lot of time consuming. It's not always the most productive activity for an academic to do, and one of the ways we can support them is by having professional grant writers support them. Another thing that we need to do is to position the university so that, through our, so that 
international funders and international partners want to partner with us rather than anyone else. And that's part of the, the vision, too, for the next few years. We talked, I talked before about positioning UCT as an Afropolitan university in order to make it position that. And in research, what we've done, I think, quite successfully, is to create a number of, net, a number of networks. We've joined, for example, the Worldwide Universities Network, 19 universities. We're the only African university. And we are the access, in a way, for those other 18 universities into the continent. And almost any project which those universities want to do, we will be included as a partner in, and we will access funds through that. So some of it is external funding, let's just say, and it's through our positioning. Right. Uh, and that, <coughs> another way that we need to, I think, uh, focus on external funding is government funding. And there I think we have to challenge the funding approach of the higher education and of the Department of Science and Technology. Because by and large, their approach is one of egalitarianism, uh, to give every university the same. We get actually less money for a law student than Fort Hare does because there's a top slice for redress, which goes to Fort Hare, which we don't get. And then the formula gives us the same amount as everyone else, which means that we don't get any extra... But we do get some money for those research publications, but that's sort of after the fact if we've done them. Uh, but in general, we don't get money for being a research university. Around the world, uh, those countries that... Most countries have recognized, China was one of the first to do this, Germany has done it, France, Taiwan, Japan, has recognized that you can't have all your universities being research universities. You've yes, got so to be selective. So if the Chinese are able to do that, should we not be pushing for the fact that maybe there should be two or three great universities that do research in this country and have the courage to say so? Exactly. And I, I have we? said that. I have said that. Where have you said it's that? It's an unpopular... Two, two, firstly, to the HISA group, the Higher Education okay. Slavery. And they don't like you for that. And to the, and to the minister, yeah. And they don't like that view. And because, because, of course, the three or four universities that are likely to be the research universities of the country are also the universities that were historically... Yes, well, that's why I asked you earlier about reconfiguring identity. Unless you do that, we're going to be, we're going to be dead in the water. We've got to right. do that. that yeah. Well, let me ask we you... do have to say, we do have to make the point, if our country, if our government wants to have world-class universities, universities that are competitive, that, that are doing the research that has been done elsewhere, can adapt... They need, we need to concentrate some of those resources. All right. I want to move on uh, because I want to ask people from the audience, but I have two short questions to ask you before that. Do we take money from anybody? For example, beer companies, cigarette companies, do we take from anybody? Um, do we have an ethical... Because <laughs> I'm going to be asked about, I'm going to be asking about green universities. So I'm intrigued is whether we take money from polluters. So... Um, or would you want to think about that whilst no, I... No, we don't. We don't. Uh, we only, uh, historically, we seem, the university seems to have developed a policy that there is only one industry we don't take money from, and that's tobacco. Oh, beer's okay. Beer is okay. At the How moment. come the one of them? <laughs> so is gambling. Gambling okay too? So are the oil industries and the fracking uh, industry. So right now... So, <laughs> But we, where, where the, the policy is interesting that you raise it because we're, we're trying to refine it. Interestingly, it seems to me that there's a greater level of comfort taking money for research from those industries because, if, because you can um, control better the oversight, the kinds of strings that might be attached or not attached and separate them than taking donor money where there isn't necessarily a direct link but there is an indebtedness that, that uh, accumulates uh, over time. So uh, we have a proposal in, in going to go to Senate later this year that says we should not take donor money from the alcohol industry, and we'll be discussing that. Oh, I look that. forward to seeing what the result of that will be. Uh, but at the moment, um, we look at each one on its merits. We look okay. at whether we think it will interfere with the research or not, whether it actually promotes a uh, positive uh, intervention in a sector. For example, we do get money from the gambling industry, and it's used to fund research that looks at um, how you deal with it, it, gambling addictions. Uh, All right. We have to make sure that it's managed appropriately. I'm sorry to cut you short there. I want one final question before I turn to the audience on the first segment, on this whole segment. You, you've mentioned your Afropolitan vision now, and you made quite a lot of that in your first lecture. And you said, quote, academics and others from around the world will know in 2012 
that if you want to understand Africa, you must come to UCT. Well, it's 2013. Uh, is that true? Do Af academics and others say, ah, Africa, UCT? <laughs> That's what you claimed. Well, um, I, think, I think they do, whether it's because we... I don't know that I can claim that it's because of the Afropolitan activities that we've been doing, although I think that's contributed a lot. So in 2011, 2012, we had 90 universities coming to visit us, two a week nearly. And the reason they were coming, these were delegations of vice chancellors, deputy vice chancellors, research uh, two a week. And, uh, and the reason they were coming was because uh, they, on their part, wanted to be involved with the continent in some ways. And when they looked at the continent and said, who should be our partner of choice, UCT jumps up. And as I say, it's partly because we're ranked number one in the continent, so it's not only that. But I think when we, we, because of our various networks, we have a network called the Ushipia Network with seven universities. We're part of something called ARISE, which is inter-university, uh, African universities, eight other African universities, collaborative research. We have about 40 postdocs from other universities. But is that helping us to actually say to people, if you want to see... Africa through an African lens, you come here. Well, it's helping... Which is what you claim, yeah. and which is really an important claim, and that's why I wanted to probe you on it. Yeah, it does it in two ways. One is because we have collaborations with universities across the continent in many research areas. We don't claim to have all the expertise on mineral resource extraction in the Congo or in the DRC. What we do say is that we are partnered with three universities that are interested in mining and across the continent. But we also do have the expertise. So the Graduate School of Business, the GSB, since the new director was appointed three years ago, three and a half years ago, has made its goal explicitly to understand the emerging markets in Africa uh, and to have um, academics from the continent and students from the continent uh, and to do research that elucidates how one does business in those markets. Okay, so then one final question I have to ask you. You raised the question of rankings. You say we rank number one in Africa. So obviously rankings count, at least to that extent. But on the other hand, when I put it to you, when we're having a discussion, why can Australian university have five or six in the top hundred? You gave me a whole long thing about, well, rankings aren't so accurate and they're biased and what have you. So you can't have it both ways. Why have we not got one university in this country, particularly us, which is not ranked in the top 50 in the world? I mean, isn't it disgraceful that Australia, of all places, <laughs> should have five and we don't have one? I mean, it really annoys me. And I go teach there, and it kind of frustrates me that they are very good. Well, it's, first and foremost, it's about money, okay? Ah. And uh, out of the universities, the countries of the world, there are only... Um, three countries that are not OECD countries. There are no poor countries that have, no low-income countries that have any universities in the top 400. There are no lower middle-income countries in the top oh, 400. True. And there are only three middle-income countries and four universities, two from China, one from Brazil, and one from South Africa. That's us uh, in, in the top, sorry, in the top 200 there. Uh, and that's because uh, those rankings depend heavily on two things on the research output, which in turn is about how much money is going in. And that money is often going in from research councils and from uh, such as the National Institutes of Health. And Australia is generous with its research funding. And secondly, uh, the rankings are linked to staff-student ratios. And universities that and have... And we've had an explosion better, of students. Had an explosion of students okay. and not the funding to increase our student numbers, our staff But numbers. surely we should be aiming. I mean, surely we should be aiming to say... because. Clearly, if we were a top 50 university, I, know the, I'm, I accept all the stuff about the rankings. You would accept that more people would probably want to come here. I mean, these rankings do influence all sorts of things. Yeah, maybe it may be a perfume mentality, but it does yeah, do that. And unfortunately, they matter a lot. When we, when we advertise academic posts and we ask people from overseas, we get a lot of overseas applicants why they've applied. It's because of the rankings. We get, we get nearly 1,000 overseas students here for a semester, just a semester study abroad students. They tell us they're coming here because of the rankings, and we do make money out of them. We do, we do. These are not cross-subsidised. This is a source of income, so it benefits the university. But um, so, so rankings matter. Unfortunately, the world takes a lot of notice about it. 
would it, would, would, what would we have to compromise to get there? I think we would have to compromise too much. What? I'll, I'll tell you. And, so I, if, and, if, and if that was the trade-off, I'm not sure that I would go for a top 50 ranking. But what would we have to compromise? Well, the rankings don't look at all, for example, at whether you bring in students who are from previously disadvantaged backgrounds, first-generation students. And so universities like us that have to spend um, perhaps um, 10% or 20% of their teaching budget on the fact that students spend an extra year or two out of a three-year degree, and that's not money that we get, that's not a teaching that we get paid to do. Mm-hmm. So we're spreading our teaching resources an extra 25% um, to do that. There's no brownie points in the ranking systems for that. Uh, social engagement, the fact that we have uh, everything from Shawco to engaged scholarship, the four initiatives you talked about, the crime and violence, poverty and inequality, these are initiatives which we do because we think the university is an important social player. Yes, but those could be part of the centre of real considerable research, which but, has great relevance to the world the, in general and Africa in particular. True, but for example, if you wanted to get your sightings up, your, your, which is how this works, you would publish in an international journal and you would have to do work which was mainly of interest to an international community. If you do work about crime in Hanover Park, then you're going to be publishing different sorts of publications, different kinds of output. Well, the Children's Institute produces this phenomenal child gauge each year, a, f- a fantastic amount of research, statistics, uh, guides policy, but scores no points in the citations or publication okay. rankings. Because, All right. You know, so, so I think it is a trade-off. And, yeah, I think the effort that we need to put into teaching and into redress uh, is, is a challenge for us. Now, before I move on to the controversial topic about transformation, both of staff and students, I wonder whether there's anybody, because I have really touched on questions that people have asked. And so if anybody wants to ask questions on anything that we've dealt with until now, I'd be delighted to take them. Not that I can see anybody here. Oh, yes, please. Institution in the country. I don't need that. You may. First time ever. Okay, okay. Professor Morris, carry on. Um, I want to come back to this question of, of publications, research, and citations. UCT is quite rightly very proud of this fact. But I think there's, an, there's another kind of culture at the place when push comes to shove, where, when this doesn't get taken into account. We're facing budget cuts at the moment. This is a very peculiar institution. You can't do anything on the income side if you're a highly uh, research-intensive department. You can only do it on the basis of of teaching. You don't... uh, If you would give the economics department and say to them, okay, fine, you double your publication rate, we will take that off your 850,000 that poor Edwin has to find this year. If If you raise 10 million bucks for j you can take the institutional overhead and set that off against the cuts that you have to have. But that's not, a, that's not on the table. What's on the table simply is that you have your cuts and you solve the problem through increased teaching. That's what it comes down to in some way, or giving up on certain kinds of posts. That's a real problem in an institution which claims that it is the premier research institution in the country. There should be a way of of us, of, of incentivizing this, this, the, the role of research and publication. Got the point. Do you want to respond? Uh, we have... There's, I'm just waving another hand there. No, no, I'll, I'll get another... No, I'll take... I'll respond to this, and then I'll come... Okay. I promise I'll come to you. <coughs> yeah. So the, the... I mean, the money that we have to spend comes really from... We, we don't get significant amounts in, in, in endowments... So it comes from uh, the government, the block grant, which is di- directly rela- rela- linked to teaching, student fees, and research grants. Um, when a unit generates a whole lot of research money uh, and employs staff, though th- that incurs costs, of course, for the central university. Um, they're inevitable costs. They, uh, whether it's the HR department or the audit team or the fact that we end up going to the CCMA uh, when, when, when that unit shrinks and we have to retrench staff or the space or the parking or the security, all of that stuff are real overheads and we can drown in the gifts if we just take the gifts without uh, increasing the um, 
central costs or the allocation centrally. That has to come from somewhere. And if the and our our research now it's not it's not marginal. Our research grants uh, the amount the money we get in through that third source of research is is about a third of our total budget. Our our budget uh, is we get about a billion rand in 1.2 billion from block grants for teaching, about 900 million so it's a very similar amount for fee from fees and about 800 million from research. So this is a third of the university runs on soft money. And uh, that third needs to be supported. So the only way you can do it, and it happens in all universities, our overheads, are, our so-called cost recovery overheads, are very small. They're, they should be 20%. The average actually is about 10% because the deans often waive it if they can find the source elsewhere. At most overseas universities, it would be about 40%. Um, so I don't think we can move away from that uh, cost recovery overhead story and just give it to the university. But that means you are going to have to, uh, to increase the teaching obligations in order to get more money. And, yeah, and, and, that, also, and then he's right. That means that the research side, you will not be able to sustain yourself in an internationally competitive world with research. No, no, sorry. The, we'll, we'll have to do both. But the, the research that we do now that's got us to where we are is yeah. soft-funded research. But it may it's be not more, funded, it's yeah. not largely funded by us. What we put into research is small. That research needs to expand by getting more soft money in. Yeah, but it's if you don't, then the you're going to put more pressure on, on the staff to teach, and that's going to diminish your research. Yeah, but we're not doing that to cross-subsidize the research. It's not that we're the ones taking the money from oh, the, right. from the okay. teaching and putting it into research. The research expansion needs to be funded through mostly external money, and we might be able to... There may be things we have to stop doing, I do think we always have to look, both in the administration, you know, I mentioned that it's, it's a big administration, but also in teaching, where courses are not viable or where, there's, where they're essentially, essentially loss-making courses, unfortunately, we have to look hard and say, should we continue to subsidise them? Right, I'm going to come back to some of that, if I may, but uh, I, there was a question, yes. Professor Turok, I think. Yes, thank you. I want to follow on something that Dennis Davis asked. What weight do you put on your relations with universities across Africa as is compared to your relations with, say, UK and other countries? What sort of priority do you give to those relationships? And a little bit following on from that, would you claim that UCT as an institution is an inspiration, an intellectual inspiration in South Africa? And if so, on what basis? Well, he's hardly going to say no to the latter. <laughs> you should have... <laughs> um, so I think what we've tried to do in the last five years, in, the, in terms of your first question, is to turn our face from being almost exclusively facing Europe, America, Canada, and perhaps Australia, to uh, facing the continent. And we've done that, uh, and, and I think that's, uh, there's a significant amount of activity uh, it's done partly through networks that we've created. It's been done through, for example, funding. Many of our departments have never had links with the continent, and we've had the, the Vice Chancellor Strategic Fund has put seed money out there, and this has been taken up by many departments to go and visit universities in the continent and just find out what's been done in their sister departments. And so we've had, for example, visits to Rwanda, to Malawi, to Ghana. Um, to Uganda, and these have been usually departmental-based. The DVC, Professor Nflapo, has taken uh, two or three delegations of teams of academics, ten, ten at a time, uh, to Addis Ababa, to uh, two universities in Nigeria, to, um, to Nairobi. And so we've been investing in those relationships to try to seed them and get them started. We've put up money which says, if you come up with a collaborative research project with another university, that's the requirement in order to get research funding out of this pot. And I think that it is happening. It's also, some of it is going to be a much longer-term investment because the relationship with the Global North universities is built very much on where our academics did their PhDs and where they did their postdocs. So someone who did their PhD at Imperial College comes back, maintains a link, goes there for sabbaticals, their researchers come here, and you sort of beat a path which makes it an easy relationship to build on and then when you have students you, 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 you send them there as well for their experience. At the moment now we have about a third of all of our doctoral students are from other African countries and about 40 out of our 270 postdocs 
are from other African countries. And that's an important investment for us because once they've graduated and they go back, they go back to their institutions and that becomes the, the start of those relationships which we hope will grow. <coughs> now the question about are we, I don't know, how did you put it? Uh, inspiration. Just say yes because I want to get on with okay. another question. <laughs> we'll be here all night. I think we are. Okay. Now I want to I deal with the question of transformation. And I want to talk about students and stuff. Your critics, this university, would say this is still very much a kind of Eurocentric white institution, that it's not truly an African institution, that it hasn't transformed itself. And indeed, one of the questions that was put to me uh, by a student at this university, he said, what does the Vice-Chancellor plan to do differently in his second term to ensure that the future annual UCT South African graduates are representative of the demographics of the South African population? It is the big question. And, um, a huge question, I accept that. Yeah, and uh, I think w w why we tend to get, I think, nailed unfairly is because the focus tends to be on the numbers of academic staff. And I, I think it's necessary to talk about that, and I will. C can I say that? I, I want to talk about academic staff, but can we just deal with students at the moment? Okay. Okay, so it's on the... <coughs> So on the student side, I think we're actually making very good progress. I, don't, I think that um, that I would defend would be an unfair criticism if the... Why if, do you say that? Well, just because of the numbers. Well, what are the numbers? So um, I thought you would ask, so I brought it, but I don't want to quote No, 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 no. I also looked, I also I looked up, but you, you're going to tell your audience and you're entitled to. Yeah. Um, well, at the undergraduate levels, I, I'm, I'm looking at the period from 2007 to 2012, which is roughly the period we've got statistics for. Um, so over that five-year period, at the undergraduate level, African students, Af black African students, now I'm only talking about mm, South African students, not the rest of the continent elsewhere, black South African students increased by 43% over a five-year period. That's a very substantial increase. Yes, but from what to what? Well, <laughs> in fact, I'll, I'll come to that, because uh, you mean the numbers? Yes, yeah, obviously. Yeah, yeah. So, from uh, 1 to 1.43 is not an achievement. That's I'm right. <laughs> Um, I'm interested in that. Yeah. Yeah. You so, get this in courts, you know, they're yeah. always running away from the real okay. kind of... So, so let's say that the numbers are around 5,000. Okay. Okay? Uh, it's 5 to 7,000. Out of 26,000. So I'm going to come to that. Yeah. So coloured students, coloured students increased by 23%, and white students, these are the actual numbers, declined by 4%. Right. So in the context of, of African students increasing by 43% and white students declining by 4%, you have to recognise that something's happening there, and it's happening because of a very active affirmative action admissions policy. Now, what has happened to the proportions? The reason the proportions don't affect that is because the university numbers have changed. So when I took over, uh, when I was appointed, there were about 20,000 students at UCT. And today there are 26,000 students at UCT. So the numbers have grown, and most of that growth, as you can tell, has been African and coloured students, because white numbers have gone down slightly. Um, but the and so the proportions have improved, uh, but the proportions haven't improved as much as you would expect because the total numbers have grown so substantially. So white students today have de de declined from 38% of the student community in 2007 to 33% of the student community in 2000. Now, so, so the fact that white students constitute about a third of the student community of UCT, I think, tells you that we've got a substantially transferred transformed community. Now, of course, some would say we should be aiming for a national figure of 8%, because that would be the national figure of whites in the population. And we've discussed that, and we've rejected that for, for two reasons. One is that if you look at the proportion of, of whites coming out of the school system, I mean, the proportion of students coming out of the school system that could go to university, and what proportion is white? It's not 8% white, it's about 50% white, and only 50% black. So what's the appropriate denominator the appropriate denominator may have something more to do with the eligible pool of students coming out. And the second is that we're in the Western Cape. And in the Western Cape, we're not, although we're a national university, we don't think that our targets should be national targets. We, should, we think there should be some compromise, some balance between Western Cape and national. But sorry, if you do that, and I mean this province has been desperately scarred by apartheid, not that the whole country hasn't, but I mean coloured preference, labour mm. and influx control and so forth, 
But I mean, I can't help feeling that when you go to Wits, just as an example, it seems much more an African university than mm-hmm. ours does. I mean, I taught the other day there. Um, I hadn't been back. I, I had been there for seven, eight years as an academic. I come back. I teach in the law school, in a competition law class, the 300 students in the class. I'm amazed about 75 to 80% of them are the black. It was entirely different from my experience at UCT. Mm-hmm. And you cannot feel that you're an African university, it seems to me, uh, unless you start getting into that. And I'm just intrigued. Yeah. How do yeah. we do that? Yeah. So, of course, we have many more coloured students here, yeah. as you would expect. Nothing wrong with that. I don't think that WITS is going to be able to recruit more than 3 4% of coloured students because most are not going to cross the continent, to cross the country yeah. to go there. Um, especially because. I know they probably think it's crossing the continent. It's a very good Freudian slip by you. <laughs> Which and indicates, that, by the way, country. that since you came from Johannesburg, you have truly become a Cape Townian. <laughs> um, so but, can I, but can I ask yeah. you, okay, then can so I... So the just, target is yeah. higher. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. The target is to, our target is to have more black South African students than we have. We have currently about 29%. So, there, so when we look at those, balance, those proportions, uh, and of course because colours constitute 50% of the population in the Western Cape, as opposed to 8% nationally, we're going to have uh, a much higher proportion here. Uh, but I think that we still, our, our goal is certainly still to have more. Can I just here. ask you in relation there to, I know it's jumping around a bit, but the, the issue of fees, if you push your fees up higher, won't that make it more difficult for black students to come here? Well, I think that our fee policy has been one of the successes of transformation. Right. Um, that we've made the university much more accessible. So we, 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 we slipped off the discussion about income and revenue generation before uh, saying... How do we generate money from... Why, why are we able in some ways to be a better university than average in the country, given that we don't get more money from government for the students that we have? And the answer is in the fees. The fees are higher than any other university in most cases, and in some cases substantially higher, sometimes 50 to 80% higher than some universities in some cases. <coughs> but um, because that's what you need if you're going to improve your staff-student ratio and if you're going to protect time for doing research and be able to fund research. But you can only do that, and the government only, I think, allows us to do that, if we can guarantee that the fees do not constitute an obstacle to access. And the, way, the reason they don't is because we've put in place a very generous financial aid scheme. And to a significant extent, that financial aid scheme is cross-subsidized by the high fees. Could I, just, could I just ask one question on this, because uh, I'm, I'm conscious of time as well. The issue of which came up, a question related there to, was this anxiety expressed by a student, a master's student, who writes in and observes the issue of the increase in exchange students, in which you indeed yourself said we make money off them. And then he says, is UCT aware of this form of quasi-gentrification and what measures are taken, what is would it take to prevent those in the previously disadvantaged, unsponsored boat from, think, from thinking in a sense that, you know, you get exchange students, they're paying the rentals, they get in, and, and there's, there's a privileging thereof simply because right. we need the money. Right. Well, the, the measure that we would take is to put a cap on it. Um, so our policy at the moment is not... Are we to, anywhere near there? Yeah, we're, we're very close to it. So our cap is 20%. Well, this is full degree students. Right. Uh, so there's exchange students and there's full degree students. For the exchange, for the full degree students, it would be 20 percent, and we're at about 18 percent. Right. Um, so that's how we, because, and it's partly because we don't want to squeeze out South African students, and it's very competitive to get in here. Uh, so why have that many? Because we think it contributes substantially to the quality of the education, the diversity in the classroom, and because most of many of those students, two thirds of them, are from other African countries. And we see ourselves as having a role with respect to that. On the exchange students, though, um, we will also have a cap, but it's more related to particular courses. So if we got a whole lot of interest in, in, in some science courses, we could absorb more there, whereas we couldn't into African studies because we already have too many American students there. We do uh, make money out of those students, and it's part of income, and it's what helps us fund, so it helps us keep, uh, fund the financial aid system that lets other students in. So we now have a financial aid system which ensures that no student who we accept academically will be prevented from getting in. All right. Can I then Even turn... to much higher levels of income than nationally, than is available to I'm other sorry to cut you short again, but can I now turn to this question 
which you've raised, and obviously I have to raise, and it's terribly important, about admissions policy and the so-called affirmative action program. Uh, it's, a, it's a debate that's been going on at this university for some time, and I recall a debate that I chaired between yourself, late Dr. Neville, Professor Neville Alexander and Professor Benatar. Where does the university stand on this issue now? So we're right in the middle of, of the discussion, we, well, and we have been for five years, but... Uh... Well, that's my problem. <coughs> Sometimes you sound like the city of Cape Town where things will get better, but God knows when. The, five, the, the, the policy has been stable for, for, for the last five years, and, and currently it still is what it has been. In other words, it's, it takes, it's, it's a race-informed policy. Yes. Um, and you've been criticised for that. And we criticised daily. And not papers. just from the right. Yeah. I mean, Professor Alexander was very critical of that yeah. in the debate and, we and had. And many of our own academics yes. are as well. Uh, the council, because of the concern of wanting to check whether, we, whether, we, whether there are alternatives, asked, appointed a commission chaired by Judge Craig Howey, mm -hmm. and he reported back to the council at the end of last year. And that commission, which had Neville Alexander and some other academics on it, uh, asked us to move away from a race-based policy. Now, the council didn't say, yes, we'll do that, uh, and, nor did, and we put it to Senate, and nor did Senate say that. What Senate said was, well, let's explore how we might do that and see what the consequences are. But the bottom line, Senate said, is we must not move backwards from the amount of diversity that we've achieved. If we can find another way of doing it, we should do it. And the reason we think there's another way is because we think that race, one of the reasons we've used race and what race is telling us is it's a proxy for disadvantage to a significant measure. Most black people are poor and most poor people are black. There are exceptions, but it works as not a bad proxy. So what we've been doing over the last two years is we've been collecting information on our applicants that we hadn't collected before, such as have their parents got a university education or a higher tertiary education? Have their grandparents? Where do they live? What schools do they go to? Do they receive uh, social grants like pension or childcare grants? Um, what, is the la home, what language were they brought up speaking at a very young age as opposed to the language that they went to school in because we know that that creates a significant uh, handicap or disadvantage if, you, if your mother speaks in Kwasa and you go to school and start learning in English. And so <coughs> these other measures of disadvantage are turning out to be quite useful. And we now proposed a model which all the faculties are considering which um, uses a, an index of disadvantage as a way of picking up, uh, of, of selection. So your marks that you get at school are weighted by the disadvantage. So in other words, if we took two students with 70% from school, the, the, the assumption or the premise is that the student who's got 70% and has been to the township school um, and has had relatively... Uh, uh, disadvantaged background, parents uh, didn't have higher education, that that student probably has more potential, more motivated, better student, will turn out to be a better student than the student who has 70% coming from a privileged school and a privileged background. So what we then do is we weight that 70% upwards to maybe well, 77. Well, are you moving, I'm listening to this very intently, and what I'm asking is, are you moving away from predominantly race-based to a class-based analysis? So well, I can't say we're moving because the Senate and the faculty boards haven't signed off on that yet. All right. But they will and, I can't, the, and I suppose you're not going to answer the, the question the as to what your position is. No, I'm, perhaps, I'm happy to say my position. My position what is, is your position? We should move that way. We and should my, move my, to a class-based position. No, my position is that we should move to a hybrid position. That, What's the hybrid mean? That about 80% of the class is selected without regard to race. And I think that's possible using a weighting on, of disadvantage. And the 20? But it'll still be necessary to draw in about 20% of the class based on race, because otherwise... And why move can't... Backwards. And if you had adopted a class-based, bearing in mind that race and class are hugely overlaid in South Africa, what would be the difference of the result? And wouldn't you, you mean be if moving? it was only class-based? Yes. Well, t a couple of things would happen. First and maybe more than 80, 20 percent, a larger figure. I don't yeah. know. Yeah. Because, well, there are a couple of things. Firstly, there's not a small number of whites who get the benefit of a disadvantaged measure. Uh, who are at Model C schools or who are at disadvantaged schools or whose parents don't have university education. So when you bring in that measure, you, you not only increase black students, you also increase white students against 
other white students and other black students who are better. Really? In the pattern of South Africa? Yeah, that's what, that's what our modeling is showing us. Why Second, is your modeling showing? I mean, I don't know what your mod- assumptions of your model are. Because I'm well, because, because there are still significant numbers of white students whose parents... Don't, or whose grandparents don't have a higher education. But the criticism is if you kind of use race as the key factor, you're reproducing forms of identity which never get us into that non-racial component. If you're using something which in a sense really targets profound disadvantage, yeah. will you not be getting greater diversity? No, it's not hard to get a great diversity by, by targeting profound disadvantage. Profoundly disadvantaged students don't pass and don't get through their degrees. We're not looking at people coming from uh, for, at, at many people coming from remote rural schools or very poor township schools or very disadvantaged because they don't have the marks or the ability to Did, get What I'm trying university. to probe is whether we're going to reproduce some kind of non-racial bourgeois approach to uh, university community or whether we're actually going to really, through this system, promote the kind of diversity that you're talking about. I, int- no, so interestingly, when you use race as the main measure, you get a bourgeois university. Because the black students that you recruit... Is that what's happened up till now? For the five years now. that we've been faffing around? Well, for many years before that. Yeah, yeah, yeah I accept that. But I, I'm only talking about uh, the last five years because I haven't got another vice chancellor in about, front of me. I've got ab- you. About, about, two thir- <laughs> about two-thirds of our black students, uh, or half to two-thirds of our black students, would be classed as middle class. Is that, is that the answer? Is that what you're asking? In no, I'm words, just interested. How bourgeois, I, yeah, yeah, okay. how bourgeois right. is our university... Yeah. Uh, about because a lot of critics say that to me, and they say that to you. You know that. About, yeah. well, and in fact, this what this what this does is it brings in more students who are disadvantaged, who are not bourgeois, because it's giving weight to a set of factors which was not being weighted before. I'm sure there are people in the audience who'd like to ask about this. Before I turn to them, can I just talk about the staff, which I think wait, maybe wait, I just want to say one more thing. Yeah, fine. I, what what important in the race debate um, in fact, is that race is not only a proxy for disadvantage. So race is a measure of disadvantage as well. In a society where racism is still prevalent and where race stereotypes are prevalent, okay. people may perform differently because they are black and because of the expectations. And so it's not irrelevant, therefore, to include race as, uh, as one of the factors. Um, and I think that we would be, if we do, if the Senate does approve this, that we will be achieving the goal uh, that the council is seeking of moving away from a purely race-based policy because 70% of the class will be selected on criteria that do not take account of race. But if we're not going to move backwards from the diversity issue... No, no, no. I, 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 well. And I don't want to be misconstrued. The questions are not coming from, from, from the point of view of those... There are bitter mm. enders, and mm. we're not talking about them. We're talking about how do we promote diversity mm. in a way that the university, in a sense, reflects what the question put to me in the first place. If I could move to staff, which may mm. well be a more problematic issue for you, Right, because <coughs> is it not so that we are predominantly white-staffed university to, at the moment? Yeah, it is. Um, are you going to give me the figures there I'm too? Gonna, I, I looked those up. <laughs> You've got them. Come on, then. <laughs> um, so currently of our academic staff, uh, only 25% of the staff yeah. is black, meaning African, Indian, or colored. Yeah. Three quarters are white. And that's unsustainable in the long run. It's if we're going to have in the, the long run, yes. yeah, yeah. Well, that's right. Again, and again, I think that the the one of the things that's happened, which has made it hard, when 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 one looks at, so that we've got to fix that, and we're disappointed that we haven't made faster progress. And I'll talk about what we try to do and what else we can do. But I do still want to put that in 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 one context, which is that our academic staff has grown as well. And just to, let's just if we just take the lecture level, for example, the number of lecturers at UCT that over the five years, 2007, 2008 to 2012, the number of lecturers um, increased by 20%. Now, if we would have kept the same racial profile of lecturers, we would have needed black lecturers to increase by 20%. That would have been a phenomenal growth in that period of time. In fact, black lecturers increased by 17%. Uh, White lecturers also increased by 17%. And the gap was made up by international, by lecturers from the international community, which increased by about 41%. Of course, they start off a smaller base, so that's why that number is higher. But the point is that we are desperately looking for and trying to recruit South African lecturers and international lecturers, um, and the actual growth rate is significant. In, in associate professors, it's even more 
uh, dramatic. Um, in the associate professor group, the total number grew by 28%. Black associate professors grew by 71% over that period. White associate professors grew by 21%. Um, and as I say, the total was 28%. But the change in the proportion, because it's in a period of growth, went from 31 to 33. So just a marginal increase in... But what's our plan growth. going forward? But it's irreversible, and I think that... What's irreversible? This, this trend. So incrementally, progressively, well, it, how, we, we, what, we are becoming a more and more black university. But what's the game plan to ensure that we... I mean, there have been the a game, series of... The game of, plan is yes, to accelerate people's careers. Because remember that to become a professor, is roughly, you, you need roughly about 20 years after getting your PhD. Hmm. The typical career path is... PhD, two or three years or five years postdoc, junior lecturer, lecturer, senior lecturer, associate professor. Each of them is approximately four to five years to, get a, to become a professor. So the pool of people that we're recruiting as professors are the people who got their PhDs in 1993. Yeah. So when you think about what is this pool and how big is it and can we rapidly increase but it? But I'm, I'm not so worried about the professors. I mean, I, I accept that. I mean, often I think in this country we're in this huge rush uh, and, and we should be we should be we should be sensible here. Yeah. What I'm curious about is: Are we getting people coming in, your know, assistant lecturers and lecturers, yes. people with postdocs? Are we encouraging people? Are we encouraging our black graduates? Are we pushing them through to ensuring that the really good ones do PhDs, that they're encouraged to remain within? The, uh, I mean, yeah. in Brazil, there are serious programs where they, in fact either get them to do PhDs within the universities or alternatively when there's weaknesses and they send them overseas with bursaries and they bring them back. Are we doing the same thing? Because I've got a lot of complaints of questions about that, you know, people leaving, uh, uh, difficulties about programs, with postdoc programs. There are a series of questions I can put, you, put to you. But, I, but in general, the thrust is, are we doing enough? Or put it bluntly, we aren't doing enough. Well, yeah. No, I think we have, we have to find money and do more. Um, but what we are doing is, firstly, at the recruitment stage, I think the, 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 there are two parts you focus on. One is the sort of pipeline and how do we yeah. Yeah. strengthen that pipeline. And indeed, at the level of doctoral students and postdocs, there's a strong emphasis on recruiting black students into doctoral programs and into postdoctoral programs. And, but we can't find enough. And uh, it's, it's, uh, I think that it's not yet... Black professionals, black graduates, are in hot demand in the economy... And a career in academia is not yet... But we've got to glamorous. do something so about that. But frankly, my own view, and you can tell me if I'm wrong, is that it's more the biggest chance of totally transforming our staff is there rather than sort of being like Spanish football managers who pay millions of pounds for the odd superstar. Yeah, it is, and that's where we're investing. But what we also then do is we try to accelerate the career. Instead of having it take 20 years, what we're doing is investing in... We have a program called the Emerging Researchers Program, for example which funds people to buy out their teaching time instead of waiting six years for your sabbatical when you can have a substantial year of research. After three years, uh, funds are, cre are, are available to take a semester off to do research. Uh, you f they form support groups, writing groups, retreats, a whole uh, conscious intervention to accelerate that career path, um, attending into conferences and international conferences without necessarily having to present papers, which is not the usual policy, as ways of specifically um, developing new emerging researchers and stuff. So before I turn to the audience again, can I ask you, not that I'm going to have the privilege, presumably, of interviewing you in five years' time, I don't know, what, you know but, but in five years' time, when you've completed your second term, what would you, as the vice Chancellor's of the university, expect to see in relation to the staff diversity complement. How much better are we going to be in five years' time? If I have to interview another vice chancellor, am I going to so he's going to say, well, we're up to 28%, but the figures have got bigger and so on and so forth. Or are we actually going to see some fairly dramatic changes? No, I don't think they'll be dramatic. Uh, this we'll have to try to calculate more carefully, but we, we, we submit to the Department of Labor an employment equity plan. Right. And the employment equity plan we submitted five years ago for this point in time, would require us to have 10% more than we are. So instead of being 25%, we thought we would be 35%. Um, I think that as we go through it again, that 
we won't be at 35 percent in five years' time. I think that would be an unrealistic Can target. we get close to 35 percent if we I, really I think, make an effort? I, I think we is it a big pro – surely it's got to be one of our central priorities? I think it is, but if we continue to grow – if we didn't grow, we could do that. Oh, okay. But I think we will grow. All right. And I think that uh, at, at the, amongst the academics, and I think my, my, my bid would be for 30. Okay, I've tried to, to capture some of these questions, but I'm sure there are people who may want to ask other issues on this. If there are, I'm now – got – yes, there's a question there I can see. Uh, good evening. My name is Kolela um, Mangi. I've raised my issues uh, around the issues of, of transformation at, at, at UCT, so I'm not going to go in, in, in detail into that. But I think that the point that Ben Turok raised – goes to the heart of, of this whole discussion uh, and, 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 and the question of whether UCT is an inspiration or not. And, and I know you guys kind of rushed through it. Um, because you see, you can, be, you can be an excellent university without necessarily being an inspirational university to many, many people. And you'll find a situation where I, I, I went to, to a white university in the 1980s, Vitz University, that's where we know each other from, Max. I went to Wits in the 80s. And it was a purely instrumental ap uh, approach. It was like, I want to go to this university because this university is going to offer me the best. Not necessarily that I'm attached to it. Not necessarily that I feel a sense of ownership and identity to this university. But it's going to give me that. And sometimes I feel, I'm, I'm, I'm relatively new to UCT. Sometimes I feel that that there is this bifurcated uh, approach to, to UCT that people, a lot of black people, I won't, speak, I won't speak on their behalf, but my perception sometimes is that people are going to keep quiet, they're going to get what they want to get, it's going to be an excellent um, thing on their certificate, but what I'm still missing is a sense that this is our institution. Now, when you don't have that, you don't have people who are going to defend you when the department right, comes down on you. And you can't, unfortunately, Max, say, you know, we are in the Western Cape, and you know, we, we must reflect the dynamics and the democracy of the Western Cape. When, in fact, on the other hand, you get funding from a national department. And on the other hand, you, you, you are a national university. I, I, I'm saying that those arguments are not going to be very convincing. And I, I just think that UCT, I mean, even, even the, I mean, I could be Steve Beagle here in 1968. Even the question of like, who's conducting uh, uh, the conversation? What are the assumptions that are going into the conversation? What are the people who are being spoken about in the conversation saying? And what do they have to say about these matters? And, and all of those questions, it seems to me, have to redound to the issue of what is our vision as an institution in terms of being an inspiration to black students. And it's not about economic disadvantage and all these things. It's much more than that. It's about identity and being a home and yet have the excellence. Thanks very much. Thank you. Um, I, I'll, I'll, I'll just uh, let me see if there's anybody else. I'll let you, I want, because I want to pick up on some of that too. If there's somebody else who might want to ask something before we move on. Yeah. Yes, there is. Oh, yes, there is one, yeah. It's the SSC president. Yeah. Sorry? He's the SSC president. Oh, okay. Well, I didn't know that. You no, I'm telling you. <laughs> I just do, I'm a part-timer, what do I know? <laughs> Carry on. Good evening, everyone. So the SRC in particular was asked to at least make a comment or ask a question, and so I'm, I'm here speaking on behalf of the SRC right now. <coughs> there, there are a number of issues the SRC has, has tried to tackle this year, issues around quality of teaching and outsourcing and the admissions policy, uh, the fees debate is coming up, but when discussed with the SRC what was the issue in particular that we should raise at this event, transformation far and above all of the others was the one we wanted to raise. Now, to, to give some perhaps context, it was in this very month, about 45 years ago, in which students and staff sat in Bremner building to protest council, uh, going back on its offer to, to Archie Mafeji of, of an academic post at UCT. And um, we note that it was, in fact, you, Dr. Price, who wrote an apology in 2008 to, to his family, and included in that were various symbolic changes or symbolic things that the university were going to do to, to show the seriousness of its apology. But perhaps the, the best way 
that the university could uh, apologize is, is to show a, a rapid uh, and, and genuine and tangible transformation in, in the student and staff body. And, and I know a lot of, of this has been spoken about already, and so it may turn more into a comment than anything else, but I thought it's still important to raise since the SRC was asked to, to pull out a specific issue. Looking at the recent employment equity report, of course, there are various numbers in those reports, and depending on which ones you choose to pull out, you can get different pictures. Um, we have under 100 black academics staff at this university and over 1,000 uh, white academics. Black academics from 2007 up 63% and, and white academics up 49%, of course, of vastly different bases. And so while the 63 versus 49 might sound good, if you look at the bases, it's not. Both academic staff and past staff have not seen particularly noticeable transformation in the, in the past five years. And so I, I guess, and, and I'll take a liberty here, my favorite mixed metaphor is the white elephant in the room. And I think if I look at this room, if I look at Senate, uh, if I look at the employment equity report, there, there is a white elephant in the room. And, and perhaps you'd say it's unfair for me to, to use the part of in the room because it would be to imply that we're not talking about it. And I concede we are talking about it. We are trying to do as much as we can. And, and I also recognize that just 20 years after democracy, we might not have that many black academics in the country to call on. But what we're really looking for now is that out-the-box creative thinking, that, that new impetus that in the next five years is really going to change things very quickly and very noticeably. And, and perhaps you don't have the answer now, but perhaps something can be done to try and establish that, considering that we're the best university on the continent and have, no doubt, some of the best academics on the continent. There surely must be some sort of way that we can find exactly how to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Right, let's pick up on both of these. Well, the second one first, if I can. So clearly what's being asked is that, we, that you tell us that we're going to go at 30-odd percent, or we may be at 30 percent black students, uh, black staff, and we're not thinking out of the box. That, that you're saying, well, it's going to be gradual and that's it. And there's a demand there for saying, we've got to do better. You've got to do better. That's really the thrust of that yeah, question. Yeah. Um, and what's and the, the vision to do better? I, I, I'm, I'm trying to find a way of not appearing defensive, I don't think, uh, and not being defensive, but also wanting to correct what I think are misconceptions. Okay. So um, the SC president made reference both to academic staff and to the, prof the professional and administrative oh. staff. And, and I think it's, since we haven't talked about them, it's worth making the point that on that side, the staff is 72% black. Yeah. Um, there is, I think, very substantial transformation. And at the senior executive level, uh, there is probably the highest rate of, uh, of appointment of, of executives and others uh, of color in, in the group. So uh, I'm going to return now to the academic staff, because I think that's where... Yeah, I, I've a got a problem. link between what you just said and the first question, but you okay. carry on for a moment. <coughs> and um, I think that uh, when, when the, the, I don't think it's helpful to... Not to be honest, so turnover of staff at university is fairly slow. I hope you've been honest the whole evening. <laughs> no, so no, what I mean is that you can't, I can say, think out the box and aspire yes. to have. No, no, I know that, I'm, but, we, but people but, are interested in what's to, your vision. Yeah, you have to look realistically. I, I, I can't entirely hold we've, you to every we've detail. We've talked about the financial constraints, so we're not going to suddenly expand our staff. Yeah. So the opportunities for, for, for replacing white staff with black staff happen when people retire or when they resign. And on the academic side, I mean, one of the questions which came forward, I suspect we won't have time to discuss it, is the retirement age and whether that should be raised. And as people, some people know, Senate has been asked, to, asked us to investigate it, and we're going to be taking back a proposal to Senate. Uh, Senate wanted us to consider removing the, the retirement age, but one of the key reasons for keeping it is because otherwise it would further slow down transformation. I want to come to that particular point, if I may. Can we just hold that for later? Okay, right. yeah. So, so, so therefore, how much opportunity is there and how large is the pool? Um, and I think that uh, it's going to be gradual. The important thing is that it should be inexorable. And I think the important thing, coming back to Olela's uh, uh, comment about being inspirational, is that I think we would do transformation a huge amount of harm if we appoint senior black academics who are not in every way as good as their white counterparts. I think that will reproduce racial stereotypes. Even if, we, even if we're appointing them and we say, well, they have the potential and they're going to get there, 
the, the, the experience that students and staff on campus then have is of black professors who are not as good, not as internationally known, not publishing uh, as much, not the keynote speakers at conferences, as white professors. And I think that there's a real risk that we fail to be inspirational for uh, students and staff of color by, um, by re reproducing racial stereotypes. We're not doing that. And, and I think if we're going to hold that standard, it's different for admission of students because when you admit students, they have four years, six years, you know you're coming in, there may be some educational disadvantage, but you know you can correct that and they're going to graduate every much as good as someone else. But you else. see, that we're coming to the first question, uh, Professor Nanka's question is, I'm particularly interested in the following. He's quite right. I mean, we will attract more people, black people, to be blunt. To, you, know, you said it's very difficult to hold on to people because basically speaking, they get attracted Talented post black, yeah, yeah. coming to post graduates. They are commercial, and we can't hold on to them, and therefore, to, and I accept that. But I ask myself, there are many people of my generation in this room, and many of us went in, I'm sure like you did, into, into universities, not because for sure, sure as the goodness, because of the fantastic salaries we were going to earn, far from it, but because there was some dedication mm. to, to, to fighting apartheid and to to, to reconfiguring our society. And that's, we felt that the university was a place where we could do that. Now, the real thrust of the point is, if we can't actually get people to feel that this is their place, as opposed to simply an avenue mm. to get those juicy jobs, well, then we're really sunk. Mm. And so that comes back to the point of how do you do that? Now, I'm, I'm particularly interested in this. I'm worried that somehow... Are we just being populist by saying, well, if we kind of have some more black staff, that's going to help us? I'm not suggesting for one moment that's not important. It is. But how do we change the very nature of the university mm. that black students who come here, like all students, feel this is a place that they're prepared to defend and maybe that this is a place that they're prepared to develop long run? Uh, I think that's the thrust of the question. Yeah. And yeah. we're failing. We obviously are failing. Not your fault. We, I don't want you to be we, defensive. Not, we are failing. Yeah, although I also think we're making progress. Um, one of the interesting developments in the last few years has been the creation of, uh, of the establishment of something called OCTAVA, which is the UST Association of Black Alumni. And this is alumni from the past two decades, two, three decades, who have um, come together and said, we've, for three decades, we've said we had a terrible experience at UST. We just passed through there to get our degrees and to move on. Um, how can we... Uh, can, we, can we change that relationship? And in creating this association um, and having discussions around that, uh, I would say, and you speak to them, uh, that that relationship has changed for them and that they're helping us change that for current students and, and, and more recent alumni uh, just by taking ownership of the institution, by um, having a sense, exactly as you're saying, that this is their institution and they can change it. For the first time we have black alumni from this group elected to council, to uh, the convocation committee, and engaged with us um, in, in fundraising. I mean, for the first time, getting significant numbers of black alumni uh, starting to contribute to the fundraising. So we have to change that on the campus too. Um, some of it will change as the numbers change. I mean, we find, for example, in the residences, there's, for better or worse, what tends to happen is that in first year, we have residences that have a very... Uh, wide diversity or r racial diversity reflecting the student population. Um, but as it stands, white students are more likely to leave their residence system in second and third year as they get higher than black students are. And that also has something to do with social class and financial but, but aid. Can, can I just put this to you? I mean, and this is a personal experience and it, it may not be accurate and I'm sure there are many people here who have different views. But here's mine. This weekend I attended a conference of uh, students for law and social justice miles out of Brits, extraordinary part of the world. And what was interesting was that there were three, this happens every year, they have the annual conference, there were over 300 law students drawn from all the universities around the country. And over uh, more than 300, and at least 80% of them were black. What I noticed was that they reacted to me not as a white person. They were interested in my views and they were really, there was serious non-racial engagement about values and views. And I wonder to what extent we missing a trick by the fact that, to some extent, there's a seriously complex concept of what's called non-racialism, and we don't either debate that, we don't promote that, we don't deal with it, we think that we fiddle numbers, we're going to get there. Now, numbers are a hell of important, 
but values are more important. And I'm just worried about that, that the tenor of our debate always, what's our vision? That's why I asked you right up front, what's our vision for, I mean, if I asked you, what's the ideal context in which you would like in your dreams to see UCT as a, as a non-racial institution, what does it mean? For you. Yeah. Well, something I was saying earlier is I do think we focus on numbers too much, but yeah. the point that's been made... I know I've been hitting you on both sides, and, and maybe I'm fair. I'm just asking, yeah. on the, you know, is that numbers are important and that the excuses for numbers, uh, we can't continue with that. So numbers is one side of it, but in fact, much of our focus has been on what we've called the institutional climate. And the interventions have included, on the staff level... Uh, first, uh, a series of programs called the Kaluma Workshops, and then in the last year and a half, a series called the Adapt Workshops. So these are one-day workshops which are built around, I suppose, in a cliched way, called what one might call multiculturalism or stereotype, thinking about stereotypes, having those discussions about race and identity, having uh, discussions about how we see each other and what we can talk about and what we can't. Uh, more than 1,000, I think it's 1,200 UC staff members have, not, in, have been through the ADAPT workshops and a similar number previously through the, uh, were part, participated in the Kaluma workshops. And are they adapting? There's a follow-up. There's, follow uh, there's a risk of... The, one of the problems is... So we have, we have three, nearly 4,000 staff, so it's only a quarter. And one of the problems is, of course, that the people who come to those workshops, we, can't, we don't force people to come and we can't. And the people who come may well have been adapted before they came... <coughs> but, but most of the groups feel that the workshops are useful. We do evaluations of them, and they say that they're useful. So whether, whether it changes All right. how they work. But I think it's also other things, just to pick up on sure. the culture. For example, our naming of buildings committee is consciously naming and renaming buildings and structures uh, in ways that acknowledge not just the colonial heritage of the university and the great white men after whom many of the buildings are named, but... Uh, other cultures and black history and uh, indigenous uh, history. And that's part of how we change the environment that people feel they live in. Uh, to some extent, we make a point of ensuring that certain of our publications and messages are in three languages rather than in one. Um, the, the Heritage Trail that uh, highlights what the rugby field actually represented and how it was about segregation and the history of intervarsity and picking up uh, through the plaques around the campus how that history is problematic and needs to be challenged. Would you consider, it, by the way, introducing what they've done at KZN with a compulsory course course for all students at UCT? We've discussed it, and uh, the view is no. Why? Um, the, the, the two things. Uh, one, our language experts say, the people in the Multilingual Education Project, say that if you try to force people to learn a subject... Mm -hmm. They're not going to learn it. Mm -hmm. um, you just generate that resentment that we need to do more carrot than stick. Right. Um, what we will do is make available the possibility of doing conversational, in other words, not for, not for credit at the level that you need yeah, for yeah. university, but conversational communicative courses. We do already have that, and many students take it. It's offered in the residences in the evenings. Students sign up for it. Okay. And we have hundreds of students and hundreds of staff All right. who do follow. I, I, I want to move on because we're... <coughs> I know I'm standing between people and a drink or something, so it's like really worrying me. But I wanted to ask you just briefly, I touched on this, this question of the retirement age. Because a couple of the questions put to me in the questions that were circulated were that, well, we also lose a lot of really good people because they get a 65, they're still on top of their game. Why lose them when they could actually promote a transference of skills experience to a younger academic community coming up. Great universities around the world hold on to their people. As you know, in the States, there isn't a statutory retirement age. It may well be a big debate here in South Africa if it ever gets launched. Uh, I, I won't say more about it in case it comes to me as a judge. But the fact of the matter is that, that, that why is it that we, we dispense with people who really still have a huge amount to offer? The policy, the inquiry will come to Senate and Council to decide. Senate won't decide. Senate will give a, a view and, and Council will decide. My view, uh, informed by this investigation, sort of le disclosing it before it's out, is that, um, the, 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 there, that there are many reasons uh, why one should have a retirement age, 
uh, transformation is, is an important one, mm -hmm. but there are other reasons too. Just refreshing the stock of, of, of academics, new ideas. But why do somebody but, maybe the most accomplished person yeah. in the world on a particular topic? So, 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 so I think what the policy needs to do better than it does at the moment is have the mechanism to keep individuals. So not change the policy, but to keep individuals. And we do now already have a system of senior, senior scholars and senior research scholars where if your productivity is at a certain level, number of publications, number of people you're supervising, uh, or the particular contribution you make, then you can be a, given a post-retirement contract. Okay. And that exists, and we will make that more systematic. I think people's concern at the moment is that it's a bit haphazard and that no one's clear who gets the right to apply for that and how it's decided, and we need to make that more transparent. Right. Let me, let me then just ask you this. Teaching. Uh, I know you, you know this because you saw that question too. So the question which was sent to us, there are questions that, in fact, we don't take teaching seriously enough. That in fact we don't, that, that we really are hypocritical, that we say teaching is all that important, but no one will ever become a professor, even if they're the greatest teacher in the world. And that therefore we downgrade teaching, and in addition to which we don't do enough to prevent students from seeing, being subjected to appalling teachers, uh, um, uh, who do sadly lurk around in this university. Even if they're not 65. Even if they're not 65, yeah. <laughs> um, well, I think, firstly, that we've actually made some significant progress in the last uh, five years, and I'll just point to two things. Uh, one is that we've created, for the first time, what you might call a teaching track. So previously, if you were only a teacher, only a teacher and was not doing research as well, you couldn't get a permanent job in this university. Now you can. Um, and, uh, you, and departments are allowed to identify where they have those needs and to employ people who are excellent teachers or who are teachers and who don't want, aspire to do research. That was step number one. The second is that in reviewing the promotions criteria and the performance uh, assessments, what's called the standard academic, anyway, the, the, the standard uh, annual performances of academics, it used to be the case that um, teaching was not a requirement, for, good teaching was not a requirement for promotion. It had to be adequate, um, but research was uh, an absolute requirement. And so it signaled to academics all the time that only research is important. Uh, that was changed so that in all faculties now, uh, adequate performance in teaching is a sine qua non for promotion. And Could so, you become a professor because you're a great teacher? Uh, okay, so that, that we haven't got to yet, that you can become a professor without having a Do research Do you think they should be? I personally think we sh that they should, yes. So I will lead a discussion. I strongly suspect it will be rejected by the Senate, but I will lead a discussion <laughs> that, that proposes that... We should be able, you should, it should be possible to become a professor based on your teaching excellence. But I would say just that, that part of that teaching excellence uh, requires demonstration of an ongoing curiosity, an ongoing um, attitude to work and a capacity to remain up to date, to be reviewing the literature, to be innovative in your teaching itself, um, to ensure that uh, your teaching is research-informed, even if you're not the researcher. No. But I think that that's necessary because that's a big part of what we do, and we, we, we lose people who just dedicated to Now, teaching. there are questions here about the fact of accountability of teaching. I mean, that people are terrible teachers, that students get subjected to them, uh, and that we do very little about it. <coughs> and, and I was asked to ask you that, and I am. And again, uh, we've, we've improved what we can do about it. So it's hard to get rid of a, te a, a, a tenured academic, um, and especially if they're doing good research. But what we now do is we have... But they shouldn't be in the classroom. Well, so, that, so there, there are two things we could do. One is we could let them off the teaching, but you can only do that if you have other people who are dedicated to teaching. So it's one step, and it's not clear to me that that's uh, desirable because many people would rather not do less teaching, and some of our best researchers are also... Many are excellent teachers. You don't want to lose that. But that's one option, to say you're a researcher, you don't have to teach. But the, the more important one is for heads of departments to manage that. And our current annual performance appraisal not only can give you a merit, uh, amount, a merit allocation or a promotion, of course, if you're really good and you have to be good on the teaching and research, but can refuse to give you the cost of living increase if you don't meet the criteria. So there is a significant financial penalty. And part of that criteria, and also, of course, if, you've just, if, you, if you're still within your first three years, can refuse to confirm you. 
And there are academics who do not get confirmed because they don't teach enough. No, the problem is the ones who have been confirmed. That's the ones who have been confirmed, they, the mechanism at the moment is to deny them the increases that they would otherwise get, unless they're willing to get involved with academic development. Right. We have a lot of facilities. Now, some, some heads of departments say that part of the problem is that when they try to do things in order to improve, then they hit with the idea that there's academic freedom and that they, should not, they cannot interfere yeah. with the members of their department and that therefore, in a sense, it becomes the question of the slowest trip of the convoy leading the faster trip of the convoy rather than the other way around. And how do you respond to that? It's I a think, serious problem. Yeah, I think, I think that is the nature of academic management. You, you don't, it's not an authoritarian management. It's not a boss who tells you what you have to do. Uh, the academic environment is collegial and it tolerates huge independence for individuals. What they want to research, what they want to teach, how they structure their curriculum. So does the head of the department have to sit back and do nothing whilst his department plunges because there have been three or four unfortunate appointments made no, before his time no, or her but, uh, time? I'm just saying it's difficult. The instruments that a, a head of department has are, are few, but one of them, and, and mostly they are. Um, through engaging, through discussing, through trying to persuade academics to become better teachers, through doing student evaluations. No, no academic, I think, wants to be a bad teacher. And so ref reflecting But I'm that. interested in the principle of accountability. I mean, for example, I hear stories of people, you know, uh, mid-year exam, 80% of the class fails. Don't fail anything else, they fail this. But nothing happens. I mean, that's just not acceptable. Yeah. And so what, what we need to do better, I agree with you. I'm not, uh, I think we have a problem. It's part of, part of what we need to tackle in improving the teaching and learning and the throughput. What I would expect is that we review, that deans review the pass rates. They pick up those courses which are sometimes called killer courses, courses that have unusually high uh, failure rates, and they do have to intervene by okay. changing lecturers or by improving those lecturers or by... Intervening. I want to ask you just three final things, and then if anybody wants to ask, they're very welcome to do so. My, my, the real core question I want to ask you, and if you could be brief, because we've been going for a very long time, um, what's the key challenge for you over the next five years? Or, man, let me rephrase. What is your, your biggest anxiety? What's our biggest challenge going ahead? The, if you were to define one thing which may keep you awake at night... Um. Look, the biggest one would be threat to funding uh, because the government is undertaking a review of the funding formula at the moment, Sir Ramaphosa's committee, and that might uh, go for a formula that distributes even more of the national pie to historically disadvantaged universities. There's also a review of the NISFAS formula, which is the funding for financial aid, and that is likely to work against us um, in the sense that it was historically a formula based on the race profile of a university and in future it's going to be based on the socioeconomic profile. And so we have, in a sense, had the advantage of having more black students relative to how many poor students and as that changes, we're going to get less money for financial aid. So how are we going to promote a framework <laughs> that the children of this country, black children in particular, are entitled to actually go to an outstanding institution which needs money? How are we going yeah. to do that then? We have to log. We, we raise a lot of money for financial aid. Uh, our financial aid program altogether is nearly 400 million rand. 100 million is, is our own money that we put in. About 100 is from NISFAS, the National Student Financial Aid Scheme. Uh, about 100 is from philanthropy and about 100 is from corporates. And uh, we need to expand that so that we can ensure that we can do a decent job. Okay. But the other challenge, so that, yes, that's, sort of that's internal, the one challenge, yes. That's, a, that's the kind of worry that yeah. keeps me awake because that could really set us back. The challenge that I sometimes uh, feel anxious about in the sense of being responsible for providing leadership in the university is about the impact of online learning and online education globally and how that will impact on us. Because, and how is it going to? Well, it could be in a number of ways. One is that our students might think that it's better to take an online course, even just for a mm. course, mm. than to do the course at UC, especially if they're exposed to one of those lecturers you described with a 70% failure rate. And if, if, if MIT... You can't offers, blame them. Yeah. If MIT offers a maths course or a physics course or a chemistry course, which uh, is a good course and which we give credit for and they give credit for, we would have given credit if the student went to MIT to study that if they came back here. So why wouldn't we give the credit if they study online? Um, we may find that students take a significant part of their degree... 
from other universities. And we've got to think what that does to the nature of our degree, whether we allow it, whether we encourage it. I and mean, we are encouraging it already, for example, with postgraduate students, doctoral students who come here and who we find have certain gaps. And so they'll do a research methodology MOOC, a massive online open course, from an international university because there are too few of them for us to teach, perhaps, if it's a specialised area. And it works very well in our favour. But we're already encouraging students to take these courses. Right. My final question to you, subject to questions which may still come. What's your worst moment over the last five years? Um, my worst moment... This is revealing stuff. I'm sure the trade unions are... I'm hearing it. <laughs> My worst moment was um, a point in the negotiations with the Academics Union some years ago where they had already declared that they were going on strike and uh, we spent the night negotiating and, and, and finally came up with a, a solution which avoided it. But it was my worst moment because um, it certainly highlighted for me the risks and the difficulties of this sort of management. Yes. Academic the academic community is collegial. Um, it's not one where people clock in and out. Uh, some would argue that if the academics went on strike, many people wouldn't know because they're not here, but of course uh, you would after, after time. <coughs> but it, 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 it destroys the relationships. And other universities, the University of Quasar Natal had this experience, other universities have had it, that a strike in the academic community pits deans against staff, heads of departments against staff, um, and it's, it's, it'll take years to fix. And so it's, it's resulted in my coming to the view that the, the situation would have to be very extreme. And in fact, I don't think that management can tolerate a strike, nor do I think that the unions, um, the, the academics union is different. And it I wasn't me, asking you to give me your labor relations policy going forward. I was asking what the worst moment is. Well, that, that, so that was the worst moment. It was... The facing the strike and recognizing what the consequences would be. Yeah. But I think, we, and I think we need to develop in, uh, industrial relations policy going forward that does not, that, that, that avoids that at all right. costs. Okay. We need to do something. And then finally, what's your best moment? I suppose uh, the uh, chair of council uh, review was a very positive affirming moment personally. It's not so much about right. the university, but personally it was an extremely okay. positive. I want to ask experience. whether there's any one final question that anybody wants to ask. Yes, finally. You have got the last word. You can get a mic. It says one. It's down here. Oh, sorry. Or can you just, can you? Yeah, yeah. I can. Thank you very much. Um, I'll repeat it. Um, I, just, I just have a question before I. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. Um, before I came to, um, to the University of Cape Town, I'm from, I'm from Zambia. Um, I read an article that, um, where you are interviewed about building links and attracting the best, uh, the best students to from the continent to come into to South Africa and also do um, postdoctoral studies and things like that. I wanted to ask what sort of efforts will you be making um, to encourage, not, not to put a focus on encouraging African academics to come do their studies here, but allowing South Africans as well? Because I think that's one of the main problems. I think the number of international black academics at the university is growing faster than the number of South African black academics, unless I'm wrong. And also, my, my, my second question is just in relation to fees, right? Um, you, you, you mentioned that you want to attract the best um, high school graduates from, from, from the African region. Now, I want to ask what the logic is in differentiating the fees that a SADC student would pay to one who's from the rest of Africa when a student, for example, <laughs> from either the United States or Germany will pay $40,000 um, a year in academic fees but will be charged $5,000 when they come here for a university which is ranked in the top 100 or top 150 in the world. What's the logic in that? Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Right, briefly. On, on the fees issue, um, students from outside of the African content, continent are charged the highest fees and the fees are more than double our fees. Um, students from SEDEC are not charged 
um, any fee that is above our fee. There is an, a small administration fee of 3,000 Rand, which in the overall cost of study of around 80 is small. And that's, the reason for that differentiation is because the government has signed a, an agreement with other SADC countries called the SADC Protocol in terms of which we're not allowed to and shouldn't charge fees. Um, the students from the rest of Africa have an intermediate level fee, recognizing that they're unlikely to be as wealthy or as well off as students from the rest of the world, and also recognizing that we have more of a duty, we think, to the rest of the continent. So we, we have a, 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 a graded fee system. Okay. We expect to make more profit out of, out of the, or some profit out of the students from outside of Africa. Right. Um, no, I'm sorry. We've got to end. It's, it's uh, half past seven, and I feel we've really gone on for a very long time. Um, well, before I call on the Archbishop to close proceedings, let me just personally say thank you very much. I think you put up with my abuse, and, 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 and it's been a pretty kind of wide-ranging conversation. Can I also say, however, to those people, there are a whole host of questions that were asked, including things about Leospic Gardens, what it is to be a public figure like the Vice-Chancellor, uh, questions about parking, uh, uh, <laughs> questions about medical aid, and so on and so forth, a whole host of questions. I'm sorry I didn't get there. You can, as I said earlier, we'd have been here for many more hours. I do apologize. The Vice-Chancellor will respond. You know, let me end by saying this in asking the Archbishop to come up. Sometimes one feels gloomy and despondent about South Africa, but we often forget the history from where we've come. Let me give you a luminous example. Fifty years ago, to this very day, on the 19th of August 1963, the Archbishop was sentenced to a term of imprisonment and the next day, he was taken to Robben Island. Three years later on the very day, he was released. I wonder when that happened to you, Archbishop, where you actually thought we would one day in your lifetime celebrate as we will next year 20 years of democracy. I think it's an extraordinary commemoration. We should all pay tribute to the Archbishop.